they'll melt lead and then they stick it in cold water and the shape that it forms is supposed to predict what your year is going to be like. And they also cut an apple in half and if the seeds are in a pattern of a star, then you're going to have good luck for the year. But if they're in the pattern of an X, then someone's going to die that year. But when you look at the bottom of the apple, you can kind of tell if it's going to be a star or an X. So people mostly just cheat on it. <laughs> and they have ones where girls will sh throw their shoes. They'll have their backs facing the door and they'll throw their shoe over their head. And if it's pointing towards the door, that means you're going to get married that year. And if it's not, then it's going to be a long time before you get married. Contact lenses were invented there. So they live in tiny apartments in the city. And then on weekends, they go to a cottage that they have out in the open area. And they'll have like a garden there. Grocery stores are different because you have to bag all your stuff. They don't, nobody bags them for you. In Easter, they build really long whips. <laughs> They're not real whips like we think of out of leather and they move a lot. It's just like branches that they weave together and they put colored ribbon at the end. And the men go around and whip the women and the women give them alcohol or chocolate in exchange for it. And so they'll go from house to house and whip the women and then they get either drunker and drunker or more and more candy <laughs> as they go. And it's a really bizarre tradition, but one of the women explained it, how it had roots in like a pagan celebration of spring and how it was supposed to represent fertility or something like that. Usually it's all in good fun, like people don't get really hurt, but I had a really hard time understanding that when I first got there. And I even, when Easter got close, I'd ask, what does Easter mean to you? And once I talked to a guy who had just come back from Ireland, but he was Czech and he was like, you know, I used to think that was normal and then I left and I realized that that's a really weird tradition and anyone else would look at that as being a really bad thing. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's probably true, but it's different, but it, it ended up being fun. So a few days before Christmas, they have like a, a Santa Claus and a devil and they go around and they like, tell you if you're, you've been good or bad and they give you candy if you've been good and the devil's supposed to put you little kids in his bag if he hasn't been good and stuff like that. They call him Nikolash, that's like Nicholas. But that's a few days before then on Christmas Eve, that's the big day for them, Christmas Eve, and it kind of lasts for three days. So you have Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then the next day. They eat carp like fish and potato salad for Christmas which I was always like, that's a summer food. Why do we eat that at Christmas? But it does, and carp has a lot of little tiny bones in it. So they say that there are stories of people choking on them every year, but people still eat carp. <laughs> Prague is like a little fairy tale city, but they love their fairy tales. They have like their own collection of Czech fairy tales. They play them on TV, especially on Christmas day. And everybody, even adults, sits down with their family and watches them. There's even a city called, that's known as like the city of fairy tales. It's an R and then it has a little, it's called a hot check over it. It's like a little arrow over it. It sounds like So it's like rolling your R but then a Z at the same time. They have more verbs than English, that's for sure. Like they have a verb for calling someone but the other person doesn't pick it up, you just call it so they have your number. And it's prozvolny. And ever since I've been back, I've been like, oh, I wish we had a word for that. We don't. So in Prague, there definitely are kind of ugly apartment buildings. They're just made out of cement, but they try and make them nicer by painting them fun colors. <laughs> So that's kind of cool. So this is the best soda you'll ever taste in your life. It's called Kofala and it is like during communism they made it because they didn't want to import like American Coca-Cola. So they made their own soda called Kofala. And the first time you drink it, it kind of tastes like black licorice and you're just like, wow, like who would ever drink that? But then like you drink it a few more times and you're just like, that is like the best thing I've ever drank it. In the Czech Republic and Slovakia, they have this weird, like, law 
that if your doctor tells you to do something that you have to do it and if you don't like they can like there can be legal consequences there's an amazing story in the Czech Republic of this lady named Milada Horakova she was a philosopher and she was involved in politics and she was in the underground movement um, during the Nazi regime she was discovered um, by the Nazi police, and she was initially sentenced to death, um, but they changed her sentence to lifetime in prison, so they sent her to a concentration camp called Terezin. And so she was tortured for information, she went through just indescribable things at this concentration camp, um, which was very difficult for her, but as soon as the regime fell, she was back on the scene with politics, trying to help the country become a more solid, a, a better place. Um, but then around 1948, when the Communist Party uh, really took a, a hold over the Czech Republic, pretty oppressive hold, she was again arrested for speaking up for human rights, for speaking up for, um, or speaking against the things that the party was doing at this time. And you think of this, this lady who's had, who's been abused and tortured by um, foreigners during World War II, and now she's being abused and tortured by her own people during communism. And she never resigned her beliefs. Uh, she always stuck to what she believed and what she believed was best for the Czech Republic. And eventually she was sentenced to a trial that was scripted. And it was televised to the whole country, but the entire trial was a script of what she was supposed to say, what the defendant was supposed to say, what the prosecuting uh, attorney was supposed to say. And... She didn't follow the script. And because of that, she was sentenced to death within two weeks. And she was sentenced to death by hanging. And I think it's a, an amazing example of what a good Czech person is. They will stick to what they believe and what they know is right all the way through. And she was an amazing woman. This is an, another incredible story of uh, the Czech people and their fight for freedom. So, in 1989, in November, was when the revolution took place to overthrow communism. And it started out with a, a student demonstration. Uh, the students in Prague and in surrounding uh, villages would protest every single day um, against the oppressiveness of the communist government. And, but because they weren't as big in number, it was hard to get a lot of um, notice or a lot of um, publicity. Because, of course, the government wouldn't televise any of it. And so these groups of students would try to speak up for human rights and for freedom, but they were always pushed down. It came to the point where um, the police, um, in an effort to break up the protests, did some really bad things of uh, beating protesters, and it was peaceful protesting. Um, all the protesting was you know, trying to give flowers to the police, and but they were they were still abused and, and beaten for it. I mean, they had they had secret police dress up as citizens and go around in the protests. And as soon as they would notice one person who was kind of especially loud, um, they would just take them down right in the middle. Just incredibly incredible things that they went through. So as soon as 
the word got out of these student demonstrations to their parents, the parents started to join in. And these protests grew stronger and stronger and more and more people until um, in mid-November of 1989, literally the entire town square, and this is a huge town square, we're talking nearly a mile long, um, over 800,000 people in one of these protests filled this square, waving Czech flags, um, singing the Czech national anthem. And it was after all these incredible protests that eventually um, the communist government resigned and they put in, uh, they established a social democracy. And it was an incredible experience for me to hear people's stories in the Czech Republic of people who had been there and who had taken place in that.